You're listening to the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT podcast. I'm your host and curator, Rabbi Aprom Kipolevich, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Shalom. This is To Stir With Love, a criminal justice reform podcast. And I am here tonight with two rabbis who, of course, uh, we are here often with, Rabbi Benjamin Scheinman, who is the head CEO of the Hind Institute, Hind Helps, along with uh, Rabbi uh, Yitzchok Kolakowski, who, who is the head of chaplaincy services in the state prison in Weimar, Pennsylvania. Uh, but through Rabbi Yaman's, as we say in Hebrew, he, his mitzia, he found uh, us a, a very interesting guest, a guest who is, I think, someone that represents what this program is about, which is highlighting the problems in prisons today and also presenting options for a solution, if not a complete and total one, because we have had people who have come in and told us that they have to destroy the system. Our guest today, Brian Kane, is actually someone who not only understands the problems of the system, but has a recipe, has actually a solution on the table, which he's already started to work at. Brian, thanks for making the time to be with us. You're joining us here from Phoenix, and we appreciate you giving us this time. Brian, I'm going to let you discuss in detail what it is that you're working on. But basically, what it is is that you are pushing for there to be nonprofit privatization of prison management, that the corrections facilities should be managed, run, the vision even supplied by persons like yourself in a private manner. But unlike, I think I read in your white paper, 20 states already do privatization, not as a for-profit company that is there to make money for investors and stockholders, but as a nonprofit that is going to be committed to something higher, to something better. And that betterment is actually a real correctional institute, as opposed to just a holding cell and a place to harden people, but actually a place to get them ready for coming back into society and training them. And um, this is something that you already started to do. And Brian, your CV says that you were actually a, a head of a prison, I guess, would you call it a warden, Brian? And, and you've been in the Department of Corrections. You worked for, for close to three decades in that area. And you jettisoned yourself out of it because you saw the issues that were there and you've decided to come up with this different type of plan. So Brian, tell me before we get into the details of the plan, can you talk a little bit about your experience as a warden in other places, like where you were and what was the moment in when you came to that sense that I'm not in this job anymore the way it is, I'm going to do it better? Thank you so much. And if I could start by saying thank you to Rabbi Scheinman for his introductions, his understanding of the problem and his vision for change and corrections. Uh, he's the reason why we're, we're having the conversation tonight. So uh, thank you, sir. Um, I worked in uh, corrections for 28 years. Um, I served in the Marine Corps. I got out, went to college for criminal justice, was looking for a career. And there was this private prison in Minnesota that was just starting. And through my criminal justice classes, they talked about private corrections because back then it was a new concept. And you know, they, they referenced that you know, it's a contract base and I thought it was an interesting idea. So I applied in Appleton, Minnesota, middle of nowhere, Minnesota. And I took a, a position as a in a startup prison, the 20, I guess it's 29 years ago now. And I, I was hired in security. I wore a uniform. So I managed the day-to-day -day operations of, of, operation, of security. Moved up relatively quick um, is, as far as uh, responsibility to the warden position. And I was a warden at five prisons across the United States, from Tennessee to Arizona to New Mexico to Nevada to back to uh, Arizona. Let me ask you, Brian. I'm happy that you rose in the ranks and obviously your military background and I look, we all know, I mean, all of us here, we're rabbis, but we all know about the Marines and we all know the discipline and excellence that is associated with the Marine Corps. 
when I hear Marine, I hear you're not just a grunt. Obviously, being in the Marines and excelling there gave you that sense of working and working in, in that type of environment. But why, Brian, if I would be running a uh, job interview, I'd say, Brian, so what happened? Five different places? Like, that's what, a couple, like three or four years each place? Why was, is that typical for a warden to sort of like hop around from all these different places? It actually it is. My skill set was on fixing prisons. So I was sent from place to place to mend cultures, to fix cultures, uh, you know, to make them more secure, make them more humane, uh, and, you know, safe places to live for the population, for the staff. So I probably moved more than most, but you know, my purpose was to help correct uh, problems, uh, you know, within those correctional facilities that I was transferred to. And all of those, the ones you've mentioned, Brian, those were all government facilities. They were not privatized. They were all government facilities. And they sort of zeroed in on you for good reasons. It's not like they wanted a tough warden to put everybody in line. They wanted someone who could manage, who could actually be a more compassionate and effective warden. To back up a second, actually, all those facilities was was for private corrections. Uh, so okay. I did work for a, a private company. But I think an analogy that's helpful to many that, that don't really understand how prisons or jails work is it's a community. It's a town. It's in a small space, uh, you know, but inside of our, our community, we have our own police department, our own public works, our own cafeteria, our own high school, our own chapel, our own everything. So really, when you look at a prison, it's really a small town or small community. So the title that our country uses is warden, but probably a better example or analogy is, is you're really a city manager. It's just in prison, our hospital, which you know, each facility has their own medical department, which is really a, a mini hospital. As a warden, I have an in-depth understanding of who's in the hospital, why they're in the hospital, how many HIV cases, how many mental health cases, the cost in involved with that. Versus somebody in a free world community is not going to have that understanding of their local hospital. So really, you know, the title is warden, but in all actuality, it's more of a city manager. And you did this in these places. And it was obviously uh, uh, an intense job. And I would assume, I'm not going to check your bank account. I'd assume you're paid pretty well for it because it was a for-profit industry, right? I think commensurate to government corrections. Um, I don't know. It's much different. It was a for-profit business. And clearly there's a, an additional skill set on the private side because you have to operate the prison similar to the government, but you also have the, the business responsibilities tapped on. So you would meet with the corporation head sometimes or talk with them on the phone about cutting costs and other things that a corporation sort of does. I mean, I get that impression from your white paper. Because one of the things you said, and this is what I'm trying to get you to talk about, is what was some of maybe your frustrations? I mean, I would assume you were successful since you were finding positions. Why did you feel this was something that you couldn't continue to do? And thank you. My frustration wasn't necessarily the private corrections. My frustration was with corrections. Because private corrections is corrections. Uh, you know, they, they contract with the government to manage the population and in all essence to really follow their policies and procedures and their culture only on a contract basis. So it's really not all that different than government corrections. My frustration came just when you look at the outcomes. Uh, you look and there's, there's two that I want to key and of course corrections is filled with, with outcomes, but number one is recidivism. Uh, two thirds of the people released come back. Uh, and number two is the correctional officer lifespan is 16 years less than yours or the general public. Uh, you know, and so I think when you look at those two outcomes, I mean, what would cause somebody's lifespan to be 59 years old? Um, and two thirds, you know, when we talk recidivism, and I'm a little cautious of the term recidivism because there's really 50 different definitions to recidivism. So you have to be careful uh, when you use that in a generic manner of what that means. Um, but typically, you know, we go by Bureau of Justice definition, recidivism is when you're rearrested. So two thirds of, of our population are rearrested back in the system. 
all actuality, the last study within nine years being released, 83% were back in the system. You know, I, I just sat back and, and how in good conscience can we have a report card where we have two thirds, you know, who we're supposed to be helping are failing. In the wards chair, you have a, a different perspective because, you know, you, you have to find root causes to fix the problems. You just can't fix symptoms because it just does no good. It sounds good sometimes, but it doesn't actually affect change. I mean, I was a warden for 14 years and the longer I was a warden, the better I understood the challenges we were having in our country, all of our country, the more frustrated I became that, you know, how can we keep treating our people this way? When I say people, I'm talking incarcerated people. I'm talking the staff that, that work in the facilities. I'm talking general society. You know, the cost burden of corrections is tremendous. The victims of the crimes, if we don't help them when they're in, hopefully the first time, and they're creating more victims because they're recidivating. I mean, it's just the whole system to me was broken, you know, and I, and I sat back and I was like, we have to do this different. This isn't working, um, you know, and so this was an act of faith for me. I, I have a good understanding of the system. I, I understand the root cause, but more importantly, I have a start of how we can fix this problem, um, you know, and so uh, I couldn't do it, you know, on the contract side or on the government side. I decided to leave and found this full-service nonprofit corrections company, first of its kind in the United States and the second in the world. I noted that in your paper, you mentioned that there was already another one in Belize. So that's sort of like a fun fact to know, but are you in contact with the people in Belize? Did you talk to them? Talk about how, it, how it's working in Belize. Actually, we, we traveled, some of our leadership team went, went to Belize a couple months back <clears throat> to take a look at the facility. Um, now, Belize is, has a bit of a different challenge being a third world country. But in 2002, some business leaders, uh, Rotarians actually, went to the government and said, hey, we, we toured the prison. Now, Belize only has one prison and jail. It's all the same place. There's only one in the whole country. So they went to the government and said, hey, you can't treat people that way. And, you know, Governor came back and said, well, then you run. And so they created a foundation called the Colby Foundation, which contracts with the government on a per diem per day per person basis. And they took over uh, leadership of the Belize facility. There was rampant corruption, you know, money-wise, relationship-wise. Uh, people were sleeping on the ground. Uh, they were eating food out of five-gallon pail buckets. It was dirt no running water or facilities, they had a hard time getting you know, potable water, drinkable water to the facility. So Colby took over and brought in the resources of the businesses and financial community and, and brought, uh, you know, sewer and they brought um, food and they brought programming because previous to them, they had no programs. Belize is a, is a Central American country. It's sort of like Mexico, I think. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I know the prisons in Mexico are known to be terrible. So it's sort of like anything was probably better than what they'd had before, right? Being in prison in Central or South America, we know is definitely a horror story for everyone. So it would seem getting any sort of company involved, it would definitely be better than it was, right? It's sort of a model, but really not, right? Because it sounds like they had to be nonprofit. Why did they have to be nonprofit? Well, they thought that was the best way to bring humanity to their system was through a nonprofit that's um, not motivated by making money. They're motivated by making a difference. And there were significant improvements made. It, it is a bit apples and oranges to the United States because you're right. Their system is different. But the point is, is they took a completely corrupt system and made it better. They made it humane or more humane, maybe is a better term than what it was, you know, and so I do stay in contact with them. I, I talk to the CEO of, of the Colby Foundation about every two weeks. I'm a security expert in corrections, and so I help him on that side. And you know, he talks through you know the challenges they've had on the nonprofit side, as far as how do they operate their facility. So the nonprofit model was a success. Now it is apples oranges. I, mean, I will admit that. So at this point, although you are now the second, are you now operating any facility at this point? Or are you just you're waiting for the funding to come in or for the advertising and the word of mouth to get out. What, what's happening now, Brian? Yeah, correct. I mean, we're a startup. 
we're a new concept. Uh, it's one thing I've learned leaving the warden chair and, and coming into uh, the leadership of, of the nonprofit is the value of networking. Uh, and so uh, we have a network every week to show people there are other options between government corrections or private corrections. Um, you know, as a nonprofit, our purpose is to help our government leaders bring a real solution to the table, really a, a complete culture shift on how we operate facilities. I, I want you to talk about it, but before you, you, you get into the essence of your vision and some of the differences, one of the things you wrote in your paper was that there's been an executive order banning privatization of correction facilities. President Biden, when he first took office, put an executive order that federal contracts, not state or local, but federal contracts could not re- be renewed with a private for-profit company. So it applies to U.S. Marshal contracts, so federal detention, it applies to the Bureau of Prisons, but it does not apply to immigration. What was pushing President Biden to issue that executive order? I think there are a lot of things involved. Uh, I think that the campaign platform was against private corrections. So I think uh, action was taken based off of the platform. So speak about that. Why is private corrections considered such a a bane of, let's say, the left-wing platform? What was so terrible about private corrections other than the fact that people were making money off of it? I worked for them for 28 years. Clearly, they're ethical, they're well-led, or I wouldn't spend 28 years with them. They are for-profit. And I think the challenge, if you look at corrections as a whole, we have a little over 2 million people incarcerated in the United States. Uh, 92% of those 2 million beds are government, whether it's state, local, or federal. Only 8% of the beds in the United States are, are private corrections. But it's a ph- philosophical issue of profit uh, is, is my understanding of why they're against it. President Biden, I guess during the campaign, also made a whole bunch of other promises about granting more clemencies to elderly, nonviolent inmates and a whole host of things. But for some reason, the only thing that he seemed to honor was this ban on for-profit prisons. Even though it's possible that the private prisons were run just as good or even better than the ones that were run by government employees. I shouldn't say this, but I think there's an interest of the union, the people who work in the government prison. I'm not a union member, but you know the, the unions are very powerful. Uh-huh. So in other words, in the private model, uh, you just hire the persons you think are going to be the most effective. You don't necessarily have to subscribe to the union rules. Is that the case, Brian? There are some union facilities in, in private corrections. It's the minority, not the majority. There are. They're, they're, they're not government unions. They're unions that represent private corrections security folks. Um, and there are some support uh, unions out there. There's not, there's not very many. Now, Brian... You talked about the life expectancy, which seemed to be, since you were on that side, you were on the CO side, that's something that hurt you almost as much as the recidivism issue. Like it was from both ends. Why is it your model you think is going to lead to a longer life expectancy? You explain in your white paper that one of the reasons why it's a very stressful job, explain how your model won't have that type of stress And the people that are working there will be in a much better position to live longer and better lives. Excellent question. It's a culture problem. It's a culture challenge. Corrections, when it comes to security and officers, they are risk adverse to somebody being compromised. Um, You know, so, uh, you know, being compromised is, you know, somebody from the population convinces a staff member to bring in drugs, uh, weapons, or fall in love uh, and get emotionally involved. Of course, anybody who is in love will pretty much do anything. So, you know, it's it's that how do we prevent that from happening in the system way before my career started, really intentionally separated the population from staff. And so over the years, there's grown a complete distrust between officers and incarcerated people and incarcerated people and officers. And and I can give you a a couple of examples. It's an informal code on the incarcerated folks that they, if they come to talk to an officer, if an incarcerated person comes up and wants to talk to correctional officer Brian Kane, he can't talk to me alone. He has to bring somebody with him, typically somebody from his race, well, almost exclusively somebody from his race, which is a whole other cause problem. 
in that way that there's a witness that that incarcerated person is not telling on somebody else or giving information about what's going on within the population. There's a complete distrust there. And so they have to have a witness just to talk to a staff member. On the staff side, if you have more than a five minute conversation with any one incarcerated person, you could be under investigation for being compromised. So I'm being pretty generic in nature just for the purpose of the conversation, but there are culture, and this is policy in many cases, that you can't become engaged in any relationship with an incarcerated person. Now, of course, personal relationships is clearly a bad idea. You can't do that, but you can't you can't engage in a professional relationship or have a professional conversation to even encourage an incarcerated person to go to GED or take his mental health meds or what have you. It's prohibited, you know, and so over time, there's this complete absolute distrust between both groups, uh, you know, and human beings are social beings. We want to help, we're wired to help, especially the younger generation that we see working in our society right now. They have to have purpose. And what purpose does corrections bring to them? So you're saying having to be this sort of like robotic automaton, showing no emotion and feeling, showing and being aggressive and pushing them around actually has a terrible effect on the CEO. The CEO has a stress because he has to really be inhuman almost when he's there, right? That's sort of, I think, what you're getting at. And you think that might be the cause for all those health issues that he won't be able to live as long. That's part of it. Inconsistency is a part of it. Um, when staff get moved to different units all the time, they have to relearn who's there. They have to relearn the supervisor for that area uh, is part of it. Why does that happen? Why is it that staff gets moved around so much? You would think someone is good at something. Is it because of suspicion that they might be connected to the gangs or might have been compromised? Is that part of the idea, moving them around so they don't become too friendly in a certain place? That's part of it. I mean, part of it is a captain or a head of security for that shift has to manage the whole place. And so they're filling gaps. If these four people call in sick, well, then I got to find four people to fill those those mandatory posts or those mandatory jobs. Well, then they're pulling people from a normal post in order to go to an area that's a sign that they're not familiar with. Plus, that you know, today there there's a huge hiring crisis in well in society in general, but especially in corrections. You know, there's so many vacancies right now that they're forcing officers to work overtime and work on their days off, in many ways, 16 hour days uh, back to back to back. You know, and so they're just trying to plug holes just to meet basic one-on-one security requirements. I don't want to steal your thunder, but one of the things you wrote in the paper, and it's it's in the public domain, people can read it, is that your model is that the officers aren't going to be wearing military-style uniforms. I think you said they're going to be wearing polo shirts. <laughs> I don't know who's got the franchise for that. Maybe Fubo, I don't know, or, or Calvin Klein, but they're going to be wearing polo shirts. And that's going to somehow lessen the sense of I'm at war with you and you're a prisoner that I'm keeping in bay because you're going to destroy the country. I, I read that and that, that sounded interesting. But what about the other things that you mentioned? Why is your model not going to have people that call in sick? You know, how is it going to be different? Why don't you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. To start off, uh, and this may be really odd for a, a Marine to say, but the military, the paramilitary within corrections is a root cause to the problem. So when you look at the incarcerated people, they're arrested by somebody with a badge. Now, I will say you're accountable for your actions, and I don't excuse uh, you know, for, for you know, crimes that were committed, but they come into the correction system, and the people that are supposed to be helping them are wearing badges, very similar to the law enforcement officer. Now, you may say, well, that's just the way that the system is designed. But the reality is they look at that badge as an authority figure, an accountability figure, and not a helping figure. So that's why, you know, there are some systems that have moved to polo shirts just to kind of soften that impact. In our model, too, where I'm a believer in measuring outcomes. And corrections is a general statement is they measure big picture outcomes, they measure recidivism, they'll measure violence, they'll measure, you know, homemade weapons, they'll, they'll measure sexual assaults. But you have to measure down to the officer level, you have to empower people with their outcomes. 
So if I'm a correctional officer and I work in G unit and that's my post every day, how do I know how effective our team is being? And there might be four officers that run that unit, same four officers every day if we have consistency. But there's no way for me to know what is our violence level? What is our GED enrollment rate? What is our idle time? Because idle time is a root cause to many of our problems in corrections when people sit around the pot all day with nothing to do. So you, you have to empower them with their outcomes, um, which brings purpose to the job. I've done this as a warden at previous facilities. And uh, at those facilities, we had very low turnover. I didn't run a correctional officer academy for three years in one place because people just never left. Part of it was, is they were empowered with their influence on human beings, on people. They could see if their program participant rate was increasing or not. They could see if their GED graduation level is increasing or not. They could see if their mental health uh, med compliance is increasing or not. Now, if you care for HIPAA there, the officers don't know the mental health details. But You're saying you, you gave them agency and they were invested in the success of the institution as opposed to being a wage slave who just had to do this job. You used information to tap into them and make them feel that they were important in terms of how they could contribute. But under the polo shirt, aren't they going to have a billy club? I mean, we know that these are tough hombres that you're going to incarcerate. These are people who have done violent, have whatever the reason why they're violent, they have been violent. They hate where they are, whatever the murals and the sunlight is, or whatever, how sweet your smile is, there's still going to be a lot of anger. There's going to be, violence, and as you said, sexual predatory behavior. So they might be wearing polo shirts, but you want them to be able to do the right thing when it's time to do the right thing, right? It's a prison. I mean, security will always be the primary. Uh, So just because you're wearing a polo shirt doesn't mean security isn't your primary responsibility. In fact, everybody who works in the prison is at least 51% security. But how do you enforce the rules? You know, if we bring a coaching model into corrections too, which is unheard of, uh, where we train the staff to have skills similar to a life coach, where they're, they're encouragers for the population, you know, and to encourage them to participate and to engage in self-help or programming activities. You know, they don't carry clubs. You know, traditional corrections, they don't carry clubs. So anything you carry on you can be used against you. The weapon you have that's best in corrections is your interpersonal skills, your soft skills, how you talk with respect and dignity to people that sometimes won't talk with respect and dignity to you. Now, there's always that code, you know, when things go bad, you you push a button or you make a call and and a team shows up and and they address the the, the problem, whether it's a fight or an assault or, or what have you. So, you know, those basic principles won't change. But the, the interpersonal skills, the, you know, the coaching model, the, the metrics, the bringing purpose to the job, uh, consistency in, in assignments so they know the people, that's what's going to bring about purpose in, in corrections. Brian, you mentioned four things, and thanks for that answer. You mentioned four things in your paper, and I want you to talk a little bit about them. One of the things you said, and we've talked about on this program, and with some of actually some of our panelists here, about the terrible food in prison, how terrible it is. And it's really disgusting, especially we or our rabbis and Orthodox Jews. To us, the idea of kosher food is a crucial thing. But you mentioned the fact that even in the places you have been, you say that they basically are subpar food. The calorie requirements are much too high. It's just to meet profit margins. There's little to any fresh vegetables. And the proof is that the staff itself won't eat that food that's served there. And this is what we expect the inmates to eat. Now, what I'm getting from you is that somehow your facility, it's going to be a more pleasant food environment. Is it only because of the fact that since the money's not going to the shareholders, it's going to be reinvested to have an upgrade in the quality? Is that the reason why it's going to be better food? In many government and private Corrections use contract food service, so they pay a for-profit company to run their food service department. Clearly, they have to meet their margins. Now, they have to meet the calorie requirements and the menu for the contract that they've agreed to. But in many ways, 
you know, I believe that what you eat is a reflection of how you think. And uh, it's junk carbs. It's, it's the cheapest stuff they can have, they can get to meet the requirements for the menu. Some will cringe saying that because, well, you know, this is a generic statement. There are systems better uh, and there are some that are worse. But uh, we have to be careful of, of what we feed the people that's, that's inside the prison, both the staff and, and carceral. Because, you know, if we want them to think pro-socially, we need to feed them, you know, and, and fuel the brain so they can think pro-socially. But why is your system, again, is it because there's going to be more money from private donors or, and because you don't have to give the shareholders the profits that you're going to be able to have a system that's three star as opposed to one star? Yeah, as it, a nonprofit, our intention is not to use any contract subservices like, like medical or food service, but we can reinvest the, the benefits of the business efficiencies back into the people and food being included in that. And, and then you talked about medical, which you just mentioned. We've talked on this program, you can listen to some of those programs about the horror of some of the, what's happened in some of the medical facilities there. Why do you believe your system is going to provide better medical care than a state or a private run? We have to pay the staff well. I mean, that's just the, the bottom line, and I hate to start there. But if we don't pay a fair wage, if we can't be competitive against the hospitals or the, the community clinics and pull the best talent away from those areas to come inside the facility, uh, you know, we're going to keep getting more of, the, more of the same. And again, you know, as a nonprofit, I mean, we really have a 21% advantage. We don't, we don't pay taxes. That we operate with just common sense business efficiency, and we can reinvest that net revenue from that contract back into salaries and wages and benefits and you know, 24 hour day daycare, which is a huge issue for staff who get mandated to work, both nurses and officers. You know, and so we can reinvest that back into taking care of our staff and our, and our people to show them they're valued because without them, the system won't work. We won't reduce recidivism unless we take care of the staff. Now, we've talked about the staff in an ancillary way, the incarcerated people. One of the things you mentioned here is also, I saw that you're going to be a little more lenient on allowing electronic devices for the incarcerated people. I know Yitzchok, you're very careful there. And I know, Willie, I know you've, you know, also about this, how buttoned down this is. We know that there's a reason why they don't want to give incarcerated people access to these devices is because I guess some sort of plot they can have or they can be connected to people on the outside. They can perhaps plan some sort of devious event or something, right? They've already begun to do this in some, some state prisons, I believe in some federal prisons, both in terms of giving people the ability to watch TV or movies and to order for commissary from these devices. And generally what's happened is the reaction has been extremely positive. People feel like more human beings. And, and this is, I think, something that I think Brian's saying all along. And that is that if you begin to treat your staff as human beings, they'll treat the inmates more like human beings. And if you can demonstrate that both the correction staff and the inmates are both considered human, you've come a long way. And that's probably the most important thing because, you know, state corrections departments, city corrections, and I see this in New York where I live, and, you know, you've probably heard all the crazy things about Rikers Island, uh, and unfortunately, they're all true. But the most fundamental thing is nobody gets treated as a human being. Government bureaucrats that oversee these places don't see correction officers as human beings, and ultimately, correction officers who've been there a while, begin to say, you know, nobody's treating me like human beings. Why should I treat these guys like human beings? And that's really the decay of the system. So, Willie, do you think that it's a good idea to give these tablets and electronic devices? Obviously, there's filters and limits on it, but you think it's so essential to being a human being today that depriving them of it, making them feel like they're living, you know, in a time warp when they can't have a modern device is really dehumanizing them. There's no question. I mean, I think it's part of a bigger picture. It's part of a picture of giving the correction officers the opportunity to relate to the inmates as human beings. And this is one of the ways that you can do that. And one of the ways that you begin to help people rehabilitate. Because if, you know, among the choices of what to watch, they have things that also give them educational opportunities. 
many of the inmates are, in addition to watching entertainment, are going to begin to take advantage of those educational opportunities. And, you know, before you know it, there is positive that's coming out of this. And it's much more than that, because it also includes, as, as you said, the food. I mean, we're feeding people that we incarcerate garbage, even if it's fresh, it tends to be garbage. And much of it is spoiled and, and rotten. Instead of feeding them things that are healthy and that are well-prepared and that ultimately will require less in the way of medical attention, particularly when you have people who are there for 20 or 30 years and become elderly, and we essentially become an assisted living facilities for them. Willie, it sounds like you're on board with Brian's ideas. I think that obviously the federal government can't do it right now, but I think states should be jumping at the opportunity to try this because they'll be able to really measure performance. You know, this is something that they can stack up against their other facilities. Obviously, there are going to be issues. Unions are not going to be jumping to do this. That will be a challenge to overcome. I mean, but, you know, there are nonprofits in other areas, whether it's social services and housing and education that have managed to make their peace with unions, uh, sometimes tenuously, sometimes in full embrace, but it works and it can be made to work. And Brian seems like a very tactful and diplomatic guy who can uh, charm the union leaders. <laughs> well, I want to talk about two things. And, and one of them is really our purview, myself and Rabbi Scheinman and of course, uh, Rabbi Kolokowski. But before we get to that, I want to talk about something that we've talked about in this program. And Willie, I think you complimented the program that we did about that, was the lack of connection to family that the prisons have, the limits of seeing children, of having your children come, that you're not being able to have your parents. We talked about uh, Yitzchak, we did a whole program, how it's only in a situation where your parent is dying that you're allowed to see the parent. Not always. And it's in a jumpsuit, and it's with two other people. Brian, I'm assuming from what you wrote that those rules are going to be greatly altered. Explain for us quickly why in most prisons they don't allow family contacts that way and how in your prison you're going to allow it and perhaps even encourage it that it won't be a problem. It's going to be a staple program. I mean, a lot of facilities that the number one way or there's perceived number one way of contraband coming into the prison is through contact visits. So family member comes in, has a baggie of heroin in their mouth. They kiss. They're allowed to have one embrace at the beginning, one embrace at the end. They pass the product through the kiss. They swallow it. Now it comes into the prison. And there are other ways within visitation to do those things too. So there's this decision made that's security-based that we're going to prohibit those kinds of contacts, which they have obviously significant value to reduce recidivism, both on the people that are inside, plus the children, which tend to get themselves in some, a bit of trouble when they have a parent that's incarcerated. So there's technology now that can see into a person's body. So if there's ways that we can still meet the security requirements, but yet allow them to have a father, a child weekend, uh, you know, where it's supervised by staff that allow them to have a engagement, maybe based off of behavior on the inside of the facility. One of the privileges is you're allowed extended visits with family members and loved ones. But that's critical to somebody who's incarcerated to have that connection to family, that connection to other humans. So what we need is some super high-tech x-ray machine that you pass through we have it it's not we need it i mean we have it it's in the airports yeah we go through it all the time we, we have it in the prisons too we have in the, i mean almost everything that's being described here sounds like the state prison where i work our lieutenants and our captains sometimes wear uniforms sometimes wear polo shirts we have contact visits we have tablets the televisions the programs the attitude of Corrections, not punishment. We're here to help. We're here to work with people. It's a very therapeutic environment. So I'm not necessarily knocking this down, but I'm saying the state can follow this model as well. It's not either or. Brian, Rabbi Yitzchak is saying that his prison, which is a state prison, is very much like the model that you described. So you see it's possible, but you still feel that you can do it better, right? 
clearly when we talk about corrections in the United States, there are some that are better and some that are not. We're talking a generic overview of corrections in the United States. But one of the challenges is still culture on the inside. If you have idle time, whether they have contact visits and better food or not, if you go down to the units every day and you see people sitting around with nothing to do all day long, you're going to have issues. You're going to have recidivism. You're going to have conflict between the staff and the population. As a nonprofit, we bring resources to bear that the government can afford, in essence. But you know, we have to keep those in the population engaged in pro-social opportunities, whether it's jobs or education or mental health or therapeutic community or what have you. But I can almost assure you that nationwide, if you look at idle time, which typically they don't measure, you will never find a metric somewhere to say how many are sitting around doing nothing. But that's a root cause. You know, and I think you know, what we bring to the table is resources beyond what the government can afford through business efficiency, reinvest back into the people. And we have access as a nonprofit to financial uh, and passionate folks outside there to augment you know, what we do on the inside. So that's really what I wanted to get to, which is the people from the outside, the religious perspective. Obviously, Yitzchuk, you are the religious guide in Waymart. How do you see in your model a greater influence of people like ourselves, of rabbis and religious guides, rabbis, priests, imams, whatever? How do you see them playing a greater role in your facility than they would be playing in the state and federal facilities that we have today? It's my opinion that faith is an important component of change in people. Typically, believers, no matter what their religion are, tend to be pro-social. They tend to follow the rules of society. Uh, They tend to engage with family. In some ways, the separation of church and state does interfere with that inside of corrections, whereas a nonprofit, we don't have that separation or that concern. So it's our belief that we augment the religious opportunities and program opportunities, faith opportunities for those within the inside to include where they go, which sometimes it's a closet, which isn't the appropriate place to practice their faith. I have a comment about this, though. Being that it, it could be a nonprofit organization that could be a parochial one, theoretically, how do we ensure that there's a diversity? One of the things that at least state where I serve we're mandated to provide a diverse array of chaplains. Whereas if it's run by, uh, I don't know, you know, even they're very well-meaning, but the particular church denomination or even not, where are the checks and balances to ensure that? Because there really is no separation of church and state. What there is is an establishment clause. And the establishment clause means that, you know, as long as all the religions are treated fairly and the same, so then they will have that opportunity. And so, you know, that's one thing you know, I see where where I serve is that we have a diversity of not only the paid chaplains, but an impetus to try to find a diverse array of volunteers to serve those who are of maybe some of the more minority faiths that are not well represented. Again, we're, we're back to the earlier comment about culture. I mean, it, it, it really starts with me as the leader of the organization. Um, faith is a priority for me. It's a priority to ensure that that people within the system have an equal ability uh, and priority to practice their faith. And I've been at facilities with 50, 60, 70 volunteers, and it was based off of we had a good chaplain. That was just, you know, outstanding at going out and recruiting. And I've been at facilities with 10 volunteers, you know, where we didn't have that kind of support mechanism or the right person uh, to facilitate that. So I'm on this journey because of faith. I believe it's the right thing to do. I believe that it's our people uh, that we're responsible for, and we will ensure that all faiths have equal representation. Um, one of the long-term goals is to actually build a religious center at each of the facility, not a small room where they, 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 you know, they practice religions, which you typically see. Some states are different. They do have a larger faith-based area. But I, I think it's important uh, you know, to make a, a central area where all faiths have access to practice their beliefs. So really, it really depends on if you do create a system that they have to share your sort of egalitarian sense of things. When you do know, again, as as a faith person, as a person whose profession is sort of faith, we know that what makes my faith a faith 
is that it's distinctly different than something else, right? Part of what makes it a faith is that it's not just a bunch of syllogisms or pithy, you know, new age statements and comments. It has to do with pretty specific, concrete ideas, which other faiths might find an anathema. So it is a tricky balance here to be able to be committed in your faith and yet still be open to others, especially as we know, the United States struggles with this. And when you have a faith that's based on free love, based on you know intermingling of, of all different sexes together, whatever it is, we know that they don't all have the same pedigree. So it's difficult, I believe, Yitzchak, I think, has a point. And I know even in his facility, there has to be a certain litmus test, right? It's up to be passed before it gets sanctioned as one of the faith systems to allow privileges to the inmates. I think one of the things that we talked about on this program was the abuse of some of, the, of that faith shield, where we had certain inmates that were phonies, you know, they would sort of like have their ear to the ground. Maybe if I say I'm Jewish, I'll be able to have a Passover meal. Or maybe if I say I'm Muslim, I'll be able to have an Id meal uh, after a certain time. But there was a lack of real, authentic feeling. I I think what you're getting at is that you hope that by creating a situation of trust, that the faith will also be more real, that the move towards faith and being involved in a religious experience as a way to change their lives at this point onward, I'm sort of putting words in your mouth, but I think that's where you're at, that if it's true, that if everything is more real between the staff and the inmates and the culture and the warden and the person involved, that it won't just be, how can I get an angle here? How can I just be able to work the system in a way that I can just slop off and do nothing? Would you say that's your answer? Right. I mean, it's, you know, our, our religious coordinator or chaplain isn't necessarily an expert in religions. It's, it's the volunteers, it's the rabbi, it's the, the pastor, you know, it's the imam that comes in that we have to support. And they're the ones that are going to make the decisions really on, on that faith. It's our responsibility. There are some security, clearly. You know, I had a, a shaman that wanted to sacrifice animals. Clearly, that's not going to happen. You know, security is important in a, in a correctional environment, but we have to trust in our religious leaders to come in to practice their faith within our organizations. Another question is, you mentioned volunteers, but, you know, we have on our paid contracts in our prison, we have a Native American chapel, and we have a rabbi. In addition to me, I'm the supervisor, but then we have a rabbi who's on contract. We have Russian Orthodox priest. We have Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, those are ones that are being paid in addition to when we're discussing, maybe we're going to start paying the Norse pagan volunteer or the, I know that the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, they, I don't think they're allowed to take money for their ministry, but theoretically would start doing that. We're not quite there yet, but we're moving in that direction. I know other states don't pay chaplains at all. I know, you know, in Virginia, I think that's the only state that doesn't pay chaplains in the state system. And because all of the chaplains, if they're paid, they're paid by a nonprofit organization, they pretty much only have Christian chaplains because that's who's sponsoring these chaplains to come in. Because it's nice to bring in volunteers and to allow volunteers, but it's not always sustainable. You know, I I remember when I lived in Virginia and I had a contract with the federal prison. I came all the time because I was getting paid. I was asked to visit the state prison. I visited one time and it just wasn't worth my time. You know, and my synagogue wasn't paying my time to go travel 40 miles in one direction to visit, you know, two or three guys. I think your point is, is that volunteerism is really something that it's hard to bank on. Unless you have very dedicated volunteers, which I've had, I've had great volunteers, and we have great volunteers, but it's not, you know, we have also for AA and for all the, these other fund and dog programs. So Brian, obviously you don't have all the answers, but I think Yitzhak raises a, a good point that if you're not going to pay people, uh, eventually some of that fervor is going to lessen Sometimes the person who you have for a couple of summers moves away and gets married and can no longer give up his time. And you want to have something in a continuous basis. 
it might be a challenge to be able to bring people in in such a way. Again, as a nonprofit, we're not driven by making money. You know, we're driven by helping people. It's not an uncommon practice to pay to bring in the, the religious leaders into helping at the facilities. Typically, it's, it's the religions that you can't find a volunteer. Um, but the, the, the reality is, is, is you know, they're sacrificing their time, their family time, you know, to come out to your facility. I mean, they have to take care of their families. They have to, they have to retire. They have to, I mean, they have college to pay. I mean, you know, and so the beauty of our concept, it, again, is, is we're not motivated by making money. We're motivated by taking care of people. And that includes taking care of our volunteers. Right. So the volunteers are like semi-volunteers because we all know Yitzchok and I will tell you the amount of time that we put in what we get some compensation for is a pittance compared to the very, very hard work that we're engaged in. Sometimes researching a question that comes on my table will take me hundreds and hundreds of hours. And again, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm telling you, you know what that's like, but you're right. If there's no envelope at the end of the day, you're going to unfortunately stop doing that. So you're going to have those envelopes, even though you're going to call them volunteers, which I think is the proper way. Well, look, you know, this is, I think, a first step, and we hope our platform will be a way, Brian, of giving over to others who listen to this about this idea. We're going to make sure that in the program notes, there'll be a link to your website. And I think that hopefully will be some steps in the right direction. You'd like to get this started soon. And you look like you still have a lot of vitality in you. You're not ready to retire. Not even close. Well, Brian, thank you for coming back. And hopefully we'll have you back here on the program as well and see what the progress is of your undertaking. So thanks a lot, Brian. want to thank everybody here who's on the panel and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for joining us for another episode from the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a single episode. 